Hello everyone, my name is Chris Pedetz, and today I'm going to present a brief overview on the evolution of Montney development. Before we get started, here's our legal disclaimer. I'd try to paraphrase this, but it would probably leave me liable for something, so I'm just going to leave it here. The way I've set this talk up is to first present a fairly quick decade-by-decade -decade summary of Montney drilling and target zones, talk a little bit about production and completions, then move on to discuss the methods used to define and evaluate the current Montney fairway, and finish with some slides pertaining to challenges and potential opportunities with Montney development moving forward. To start off, let's look at how the Montney grew to become the top resource play in Canada. By looking at historical drilling in the context of target facies, the stages of Montney development are easier to follow. The first Montney wells were vertical oil producers targeting conventional, high porosity, high permeability intervals near the formation's erosional edge in Alberta. Based on GeoScout data, the first Montney well came on production in late 1955 at Sturgeon Lake. Other areas of in initial interest include K-Bob and to further north at Gage. With 128 wells over 15 years, the Montney doesn't appear to have been too high on anyone's priority list. For history buffs, the Montney was first defined by J.H. Armitage in 1962, way over in Buick Creek in BC, from well 626-8721 West 6, where it was originally logged as the Toad Formation. Now, not a lot changed through the 1970s. A few more wells and development stepped out into Fir, Sunset, and Tangent, still in Alberta. The targets were still conventional, but there was a bit more gas production to go along with the oil. The 1980s saw more of the same, we had, with the addition of wells at Jeruville and the start of development in BC at Ring. More important, however, are the two wells toward the center of the Montney Basin, drilled in the late 1980s at Pousse Coupe and Eagle. These are the first wells targeting turbidites in the Deep Basin Montney Play. Development ramped up considerably in the 1990s. The conventional fields became more active, but the turbidite play on the Alberta side came into its own, comprising over 25% of the decade's Montney wells. Horizontal drilling was just getting started. There were a handful drilled before the end of the 90s, but they were all limited to the conventional play in the K-Bob area. The new century saw increasing interest in the turbidite play, and the conventional pools were still humming along. But with more widespread use of horizontal drilling, operators started to target the non-turbidite and non-conventional portion of the Deep Basin Montney in BC and Alberta. Overall activity was rising sharply. The 2010 saw the Montney take its place as Canada's top resource play. With horizontal drilling well established, activity exploded in the Deep Basin in northern BC and in previously undeveloped parts of Alberta. Development of a more transitional play on the edge of the Deep Basin also took off, and I'll discuss it a little bit later. Conventional development fell off, particularly in the northern portion of the play, but the old pool still maintained some interest as lower quality reservoir became accessible. And that brings us to the current decade. It looks like there's fewer wells, but we're just over two years into it. And 2020 itself was definitely not a banner year for activity. In any case, unconventional development, driven by liquids rich gas targets, continues to carry the day with not much at all going on in the old pools. So what have all these wells been putting out since the beginning of development? This is the total daily production rate from the Montney over the last 60 years. The first 30 years or so were pretty consistent with no appreciable increases until the turbidite play came on in the 1990s. Once horizontal drilling took off and well counts jumped, the Montney gas rate increased exponentially this plot is even a year or two behind now. You don't see the COVID hiccup that affected almost every play, 
but production has more than recovered since then. Our latest data puts Montney gas production at approximately 1.5 million barrels of oil equivalent per day, oil production at 60,000 barrels per day, and condensate at 100,000 barrels per day. So you might be thinking, with the huge increase in wells in the last 50 or 20 years, of course the overall production rate is going to rise. But looking at the average production rate per well in the Montney by decade shows that along with the greater number of wells drilled, the last few years have also seen a marked increase in average well performance. It's kind of interesting that the first decade of the 2000s had relatively mediocre well performance, despite marking the beginning of horizontal development, but the improvement is pretty clear after that, and it's continuing through to today's wells, and completions have a lot to do with that. Now the details of Montney completions particularly area and operator variations, merit a whole presentation on their own. But in the interest of time, these graphs can show how modern completions in the Montney have changed on an average well basis over the last eight years. Lateral lengths and profit use per well have consistently increased and go a long way toward explaining improved well performance, while the stages in fluid, which is typically water, use per well, appear to have peaked in the last year or two. So now we'll look at how the Montney is evaluated today. Let's start with geology. CDL maps four zones in the Montney based on the Davies et al. framework. The stratigraphic cross section runs from Lily, BC in the northwest to Rest Haven, Alberta in the southeast. The red well sticks indicate our interpretation of operator targets based on well bore surveys and offset logs. Most development today is focused on the upper and upper middle zones, particularly north of the Peace River Arch, where the Chloria zone at the base of the upper middle Montney is a popular target. On and south of the arch, there appears to be a growing interest in developing the lower middle and lower Montney, based on recent drilling by operators such as Oventive, Arc, Spartan Delta, and Advantage. Looking at Montney well distribution up to today, there's still a huge portion of the Montney that has yet to host a well. The reason is that, at least since horizontal drilling hit its full stride, operators have focused on developing liquids-rich gas targets. The liquids-rich fairway is well-defined in the Montney, and there are several factors that go into this definition. Let's start with structure. On these and subsequent slides, I'm only going to show the wells drilled since 1920 to show the background data a little more clearly and also to stress where the action is today. On the left is a straight up structural map of the top of the Montney. It dips fairly consistently to the southwest with some notable changes via faulting in the vicinity of the Peace River Arch and also near the Triassic Deformation Front. As depth increases, so do temperature and pressure, which play a key role in liquids distribution. Now on the right, is a third order structural map of the base of the Montney, which in a nutshell, removes the effect of present day regional dip to reveal basinal structure prior to Montney deposition, which can help to interpret lateral variations in reservoir quality. Moving on to temperature, Tmax is the maximum temperature reached during burial and dictates whether oil, condensate rich gas or dry gas are generated. Our work has shown that modern day temperatures are a good proxy for Tmax in the Montney and can be used to reasonably predict which fluid phase is dominant in a given area. Interestingly, those proxy temperatures vary significantly between areas north and south of the Peace River Arch. Gas is encountered at lower temperatures in the northern portion of the play. An important caveat to this is that these temperature based windows don't work as well in areas of dry gas migration which I'll touch on later. Now for pressure. Much of today's Montney Fairway is within the overpressure deep basin, which includes everything west of the dark gray 10 kPa per meter pressure gradient line on the map. This high pressure is key in maintaining deliverability from tight unconventional Montney Reservoir. You'll notice many wells are located east of this 10 kPa per meter line 
and they mark development within a somewhat paradoxical under-pressure deep basin system with pressure gradients between 8 and 9 kPa per meter and dominated by oil production. The plot on the left shows the pressure depth ranges for the four basic Montney play types. Conventional play data, in light blue, falls along a basic water gradient. The turbidites, in yellow, aren't far off, but several of these targets are overpressured, putting them in the deep basin regime. The majority of recent unconventional wells fall into the deep basin overpressured regime, in red, with gradients as high as 17 to 18 kPa per meter. Now the underpressured, oil-dominated deep basin regime occurs at the edge of the deep basin system and is the result of previously overpressured hydrocarbons exceeding the capillary seal capacity and leaking off into the conventional system until equilibrium is reached. This next metric probably does the best job of defining today's Montney Fairway. The wet gas index, or WGI, is defined as a volume of C2+, plus, which is the heavier gas compounds, divided by total gas volume, as determined from gas analyses. Plotting these values against actual production, whenever we're lucky enough to have liquids production reported, indicates that WGI values in excess of 15% are associated with higher condensate production. And you can see that the drilling in the last two years hasn't strayed very far from that window. Now you may notice that the contours on the map don't cover the entire Montney play. That's because this particular WGI data set is for the upper middle Montney only, which isn't present on the eastern edges of the play. The WGI maps for the other three zones aren't shown here, but they display a similar trend. In situ stresses are also an important consideration in Montney development. At risk of oversimplifying, lower in situ stresses make for easier drilling and completions because you have less force to act against when you're trying to break open rock. The minimum horizontal stress, or SH min, is an important parameter. It can't be measured directly, but a reasonable estimate can be made from fracture closure pressures. These pressures are markedly higher in BC than in Alberta, which isn't necessarily a, a bad thing. The bigger issue is when there's a bigger difference between SH min and pore pressure. This can lead to wellbore instability and other production issues as a reservoir is depleted. Let's move on to issues and potential opportunities with the current state of Montney development. Gas migration. A few slides ago, I showed a WGI map of the upper middle Montney overlaying with the newest Montney wells. This is the same map with the same wells, only the wells are colored by cumulative gas ratio, which is simply the volume of gas produced to date divided by total gas and liquids produced. Anything in red is 80% or greater, which still leaves a bit of room for liquids but I've highlighted two areas where the red dots overlay a higher WGI area. This is likely where drier gas has migrated from further west, deeper in the Montney, along high porosity perm pathways, such as faults or turbidites. There's a recent paper by Wood et al, published in 2020, that provides more detail on how these zones can be identified. Several operators are also dealing with parent-child well interference, or pressure-induced drawdown, whereby infill wells fail to reach the same production rates as the first wells on a pad, or contribute to increased decline of the earlier well's production. This is a sectional view from an example pad in the tower area, where closely spaced wells, in yellow, coincide with an area of depleted pressure. Both frack and well spacing can contribute to this phenomenon, and the biggest trick with it is that there's no one-size-fits-all solution to perfect spacing. It's, di it's dictated by reservoir conditions. Here's the same section 
and you can see how CGR values are also severely reduced in the same drawdown area. And what's going on in BC? There have been no new land sales or well licenses granted anywhere in the province since July 2021. And it stems from the BC Supreme Court ruling on industrial development within the Blueberry First Nation traditional land use area. Government negotiations are ongoing, but there's no timeline for when new development will be allowed to proceed again. Now, just to be clear, there hasn't been much of a drilling slowdown yet, as wells licensed before 2021, July 2021, have been allowed to proceed. But if nothing changes, it just stands to reason that existing licenses will eventually be used up. And there's going to be a cascade of downstream effects affecting pipeline construction and LNG export potential if development actually stops or really slows down. But let's not end on a sour note. How about some good news? In 2021, Ovinto drilled the highest rate Montney wells ever, with three wells from a single pad at sunrise, each coming on at over 31 million cubic feet a day. Many nearby wells also came on at similar rates. Ovinto's drilling and completion operations played a role in these wells' performances, and they may have very well hit a reservoir sweet spot that might not exist anywhere else but you can see they still have some room to drill. The point is, there's a lot of growth potential still out there. And here's an ACO natural gas price graph from the last couple years. It was pretty lousy at the start of COVID, but it's been trending up pretty consistently since then. It'd be foolish to predict the future at this point, but if prices continue to increase, will dry gas zones in the Montanese start to look more attractive? There's still a lot of room to drill in the deeper, hotter, and drier part of the Montney Fairway. So, to summarize everything up, the Montney started as a conventional reservoir, not getting a whole lot of attention until the turbidite play was discovered, followed by the unprecedented development of the unconventional deep basin. Today's drilling is very much focused on liquids-rich gas production, where knowledge of temperature, pressure, and gas chemistry are key in well placement decisions. Issues affecting development today include gas migration, parent-child well interference, and an indeterminate pause on future BC development. But the good news is that well production rates are hitting record levels and the recent increase in natural gas prices may allow the Montney Fairway to be expanded in the near future. One last thing, I'd invite you to check out our virtual and real life booth at the convention this year, and also to check out two talks by my colleagues, Allison and Krista, coming up later today and tomorrow. I also want to acknowledge that many of my colleagues at CDL played a role in collecting and making the data in my presentation presentable, and I want to thank in particular Allison, Meredith, Jeff, Tessa, and Kosh. And thank you for watching.